Okay. Good afternoon, colleagues, your excellencies, ministers, ambassadors, distinguished guests. I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us this evening as we celebrate the recipients of the 2014 Resolve Award. I wish to give my personal congratulations uh, to the winners uh, for this year, Peru, Tanzania, and also to make special mention of Afghanistan and Cambodia for the nominations they received. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is uh, Mike Mbizo. Uh, I served in WHO for 16 years, and uh, I retired last year as director for the Department of Reproductive Health and Research, and I'm now back in Zimbabwe where I am professor at the College of Health Sciences. In partnership with Mary Robinson, the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health, Peggy Clark, and the Aspen Institute, we dreamed up and launched the Resolve Award in 2011 in order to celebrate the leadership of country governments and their developments and success in reproductive health. I also want to greet our audience who are watching this afternoon or uh, this morning, uh, depending on where they are in the global community around the world, and encourage you to participate this evening through Twitter and also with hashtag at resolve. It is now my honor to introduce Ambassador Karen Pierce, UK permanent representative to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva, who is going to give us her opening remarks. Ambassador Pierce, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mike, um, for that introduction and for welcoming us here uh, today. And I can think of few uh, more inspiring uh, physical places to be, uh, but also few more inspiring um, subjects uh, for us to be dealing with this, this evening. And so, ministers, colleagues, and um, friends, um, it, we're very lucky in Geneva, even luckier than those of our colleagues at the UN in New York, because uh, we get to deal with a lot of very worthwhile uh, subjects. But I think this one uh, is one of the most worthwhile, uh, even within that. Uh, and I was very honored uh, to be asked to come back uh, to speak again uh, at the Resolve Awards ceremony. Uh, and I'd like in advance just to pay tribute uh, to the winners, but also all to, to all the nominees. I mean, what you do, uh, is absolutely vital, uh, not just for the health and welfare uh, of individuals, uh, but fundamentally uh, it contributes to economic development. Uh, and I do think one thing the UN can do uh, to support uh, the Aspen Institute, WHO, and all civil society's efforts in this area uh, is to carry on explaining uh, how moves like tackling sexual and reproductive health, uh, how the MDGs and the post-2015 MDGs really contribute to economic uh, development uh, and the economic and political health of societies as a whole. Um, from our perspective in the United Kingdom, we are very proud uh, to be what we think of as a leader uh, in enabling women to have access to family planning and the right to make decisions about whether or not to have children, as well as when to do so and how many to have. Uh, good health is a right, it's not a privilege, and it should be enjoyed by all without discrimination. Um, we were an early member of the World Health Organization, uh, and we also, as many of you know, have the National Health Service, uh, which is one of the earliest examples of universal uh, health care coverage. Um, we are now making uh, a very special and important effort uh, to put women and girls at the heart of our uh, development policy. Uh, some colleagues may know uh, that we recently hit the 0.7% of GDP target. Uh, Major investment in sexual and reproductive health, the rights of individuals, and particularly women and girls. And this has a very important impact uh, on equality. 
And if we are really serious about ensuring no one is left behind in post-2015 as we address these fundamental aspects, then women and girls' empowerment and choices has to be included as part of that post-2015 framework. And if we don't do that, then of course we risk disempowering uh, half the world's population. Uh, and I think when you put it like that, you realise that's just not uh, tenable. Uh, now, we do understand uh, that some aspects of sexual and reproductive rights uh, can be sensitive. Uh, they can be very difficult for many people uh, to discuss, even if we in this room uh, find it easy and take heart uh, from sharing experiences and good practices uh, back in our countries. Uh, there are many communities, many people uh, who find this a particularly difficult issue uh, and who frankly uh, oppose it. Uh, and we recognize uh, that there are different community and cultural uh, practices and traditions, uh, but practices uh, can change, uh, societies uh, can evolve. Uh, my own country, for example, has traveled a very long way uh, in terms of chastisement of children. Uh, so traditions do change. Uh, and I want in that connection, if I may, particularly to mention FGM, uh, female genital mutilation. Uh, this is going to be a big theme of a summit uh, that my Prime Minister hopes to hold uh, in the United Kingdom uh, in July. And many of your um, countrymen and um, women will, will be invited uh, to that summit. Um, we believe that FGM has no place uh, on the planet. Uh, it is inhumane. Uh, we recognise the difficulties for some communities in tackling it, but we do need, we need, we do believe we need to work together uh, to find a way forward. Uh, and this is true of all the sexual and reproductive rights agenda. We do have to help prevent girls dropping out of school. We need to help stop them facing morbidity or death if they become pregnant before their bodies are able to sustain pregnancy. We need to stop women from dying if they need to resort to an unsafe abortion. And we need to prevent adolescents from risking their health and exposing themselves to HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. So this means we also need quite comprehensive information and we need education. And it's critical that we use all the evidence we have available to help people make informed policy choices and address the gaps in sexual and reproductive health uh, for the benefit of all. So we hope to see that sexual reproductive health and rights of individuals will be respected regardless of age, sex, or any other characteristic, there's a social and an economic cost to discrimination. Uh, as we all know, this is another form or can be another form of discrimination, and we need to address the stigma and the structural factors uh, which inhibit the ability of individuals to access the services and information that they need and which are central to achieving economic progress and sustainable development. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for those uh, insightful remarks, and certainly for setting the tone uh, as you put your words and you look at the uh, uh, sustainable development agenda. I think it's very pertinent uh, that we look at the plight of the girl child and what it means if we are able to recognize and see where it is happening, where some of these interventions are taking place. Uh, it is now my honor to introduce Dr. Ario Pablos Mendez, who is the Assistant Administrator for Global Health at the U.S. Agency for International Development. I think many of you know Ariel. He is uh, uh, one of the committed uh, colleagues who has been with us uh, in the Resolve Award uh, discussions as well as uh, previous meetings. And uh, we know he has a very tight, busy schedule, but uh, once again is able to join us and share with us uh, some of the issues uh, that relate to the award. Thank you, Ariel. Welcome. Thank you, Your Excellencies, uh, Ministers, friends, colleagues, good evening. It is a real pleasure, twice the pleasure, as the Ambassador noted, because of the agenda, but also because of the wonderful setting around here. And it's, it's really a great honor for me to join you in celebrating the 2014 Resolve Award recipients. It, it is so because I've been indeed a champion of this cause, 
Ambassador Betty King and now Ambassador Pierce. It's been fantastic uh, as champions for, for this cause. And it's great, a great opportunity to celebrate the work of those who are making things happening in countries. I also would like to extend my sincere thanks to Kathy Calvin and uh, to Dr. Marlene Timmerman, who all share with us a rich and long-standing partnership. And tonight we are celebrating, indeed, the remarkable achievements of Peru, Tanzania, Afghanistan, and Cambodia for improving access to reproductive health. The important work that these countries and leaders have done lies at the core of development. And coming at USAID from some years in WHO and the Rockefeller Foundation, I became more and more familiar and passionate about the importance of family planning, empowering women, saving lives, and driving economic growth in countries around the world. Without the opportunity to determine the size and spacing of one families, too many women and couples are denied one of the most basic dreams of a parent, to provide their children with the finest education, opportunities, and employment that one can give them. As we now talk a lot about universal health coverage, it's important to remember that universal access to reproductive health is key and often bypassed. We have to keep watch. Many countries now have benefits packages that do not include family planning. We have to ensure that they are included. And also, we have to make sure that we do not forget adolescents and youth. The health choices of young people made today have immediate and long-term repercussions. Young people experience barriers to the use of available health services, lack of knowledge about sexuality and reproductive health, lack of access to services in terms of location, cost, hours of service, and friendly or judgmental providers. Communities that are not supported of young people's sexuality and use of services and unequal germ gender norms all work against youth having a healthy sexual life. These barriers are very real. One, 16 million girls aged 15 to 19 and 2 million under the age of 15 give birth every year. Girls aged 10 to 14 are five times more likely to die in pregnancy. The vast majority of these deaths occur within marriage. Efforts to end child marriage should not be overlooked given the reproductive health needs of young married women as well. Youth have been uh, relatively neglected. When we look at the great progress in under five mortality, adolescent mortality gains have lacked and we have to pay attention. In many countries, young women who have already given birth often become pregnant less than two years after giving birth. The children of adolescent mothers are more likely to be malnourished, less likely to be immunized, and to have a longer duration of hospitalizations. Nearly half of all the new HIV infections occur to people under 25. And young women are particularly at great risk. And in Africa, as we know, they are pre the predominant uh, a demographic in the epidemic. Adolescents living with HIV infected early in life are a growing cadre as well. And we need to do a better job of addressing their need, the sexuality education, family planning, to prevent unintended pregnancy, and so on. We have been witnessing lots of amazing developments recently. The progress in countries is fantastic. The commitment of global partners is great. Family Planning 2020 is bringing new resource attention. The British government, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, joining those who have been on this, uh, like USAID and many others, to advance this. We're also working with UNFPA to put forward targets for family planning and reproductive health in the post-2015 agenda. It's very important. Last time that we had MDGs, they were not at the table, and they were sort of a, an afterthought patched up later on. We had to make sure as a community that we bring this conversation to the post-2015 discussion in New York and around the world. So I continue to be very inspired by the leadership that demonstrated by the Resolve Award winners in prior years and those in, in this year. And I'm happy to see many colleagues that is amazing, those who do well in this, do well in many other things too. And I'm very, very, very privileged to be joining you here. And I look forward for the continued partnership. Congratulations to you, to each of you. And thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Ariel. And certainly uh, appreciate you reminding us that uh, within the MDG framework, uh, it took a little bit longer to have uh, uh, reproductive health as a target 
And if I always say it, uh, to my colleagues, uh, we kind of lost the ground. But I think uh, now as we are on the home stretch, uh, this is time where we can recognize the extent to which we are able to deliver on that uh, promise. Uh, the extent to which countries have said, look, we are in a hurry. We need to move forward. We need to ensure that uh, we can uh, build upon whatever successes that have been made. Colleagues, it is my honor here tonight uh, to share with you distinguished guests, our brave and tireless award winners, and my colleagues on the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health. Through this annual award process, the Council brings the weight of its leadership to highlight and recognize the critical innovations and advancements in sexual and reproductive health and in doing so, inspire others to strive for innovation and advancement, to draw on the lessons, to see what challenges have been encountered, uh, what policy environment has been conducive to some of these uh, successes. This is so important because global progress in reproductive health can only be achieved when there are groundbreaking initiatives at the country level. Our celebrations here tonight are really about those successes that are taking place at country level. These are innovations that countries should be proud of, and the acknowledgement they are receiving tonight, we all feel is well received. And this recognition comes at a critical time. We are in the home stretch for developing new global goals for replacing the MDGs and our winners tonight demonstrate that reproductive health and rights, especially as they pertain to young people, are intimately linked to the broader development agenda. I have been inspired by stories I have heard about the work that we are honoring tonight. One of the nominators for Tanzania highlighted how Tanzania is making progress in reaching women who have seen, who have never see, been able to access family planning. I would like to quote from the nominator who nominated Tanzania for the award. I quote, sometimes women who live in remote areas in Tanzania have 12 or more children, she said. They become very weak. When women in these areas learn about family planning, they have told us, thank you for saving our lives. Another nominator from Tanzania told us about why their work on adolescent HIV prevention is important. I quote, going forward, if we want to have an AIDS-free generation, we need to target young people, she said. We need to give them skills, knowledge, and information to avoid risks. Even young adolescents need the right information and skills to be able to access the services they need. A nominator from Peru talked about why their plan for reducing teen pregnancy needs engagement from multiple sectors. I quote, our plan is multi-sectorial because many government agencies recognize that addressing adolescent pregnancy is not just about condoms, she said. It is about things like chances for decent employment and funds for competing education. In Cambodia, where they have made tremendous progress in reducing maternal mortality, I also listened this afternoon uh, during the discussion, lunchtime presentation, when Cambodia made the presentation. A nominator told us why this is so important for society. I quote, a woman is the backbone of the family. She said, when women suffer, the family suffers. And the community, society suffer too. And women and a woman needs support from the health sector and from the entire community. And finally, a nominator from Afghanistan spoke the truth we all know, I caught. Empowering women and girls, educating them, will help them claim their rights. Our winners tonight show us what can work. They highlight critical lessons that have been learned in the face of challenges. And most of all, they inspire us all to move toward the goals of reproductive health and rights 
with tireless resolve. Colleagues, I would like uh, to introduce uh, my colleague here, uh, who is uh, well known uh, to us, who is going to facilitate the next uh, session, as I thank uh, Ambassador and Ariel for really having set the tone in terms of for the awards we're going to be sharing and to hear about uh, tonight. I would like to invite Dr. Musimbi Kanyoro, who is a member of the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health, to come to the podium and facilitate the presentation of the 2014 Resolve Award. Dr. Kanyoro. Dr. Kanyoro is one of the founding uh, members of the Resolve Award and serves on the high level task force on ICPD and advisory council of UN Women. Currently, she is the CEO of the Global Fund for Women, which is funding women in 175 countries, which is one of the largest uh, funding programs for women and girls. Welcome, Dr. Kanyo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. I had the privilege of uh, serving with Mike on uh, uh, his own committee during his time at the World Health Council, World uh, WHO, and I'm really pleased to be sharing this platform with you. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a privilege for me as a member of the Global Council to be here to recognize this very, very important work that has been done by countries that are working under very difficult uh, situations. We are here to recognize the extraordinary accomplishment that these countries have made. The Global Leaders Council was created to shine light on work, on efforts that are really continuing efforts. They are not completed efforts, but there is work in progress. And it recognizes people who are actually making that work continue to meet the ends to which we would be able to see the rights of women and girls being met. We know that when women are healthy, the economies grow stronger. Communities and families are more resilient and that the potential for individuals to rise becomes something that we can really be able to celebrate. Tonight, we are celebrating the third leadership award. So let me give you a little bit of a history of where we have come from. In 2012, we celebrated innovations in financing policy, service delivery, and in these ones, the Federal Republic of Nepal and the Republic of Malawi received the award in financing policy. The service delivery was received by the Republic of Ethiopia and Rwanda, and a special mention award went to Yemen. In 2013, we celebrated innovations again in financing and policy and development, service delivery, and the special award in financing and policy development went to Gambia and the Republic of Kenya, and the service delivery award went to Zambia, and a special mention was made of Sierra Leone. This year, 2014, we are celebrating again innovations, it's always going to be financing, policy development, and service delivery. We won't be honoring anyone in financing because we did not get a winner for that. And I'm gonna be challenging all of you to really make sure that you work hard to make sure we have nominees and winners in the area of financing. But we will be celebrating today Peru for policy development and the United Republic of Tanzania for the service delivery. And we make a special mention of two very important countries, Afghanistan and the Kingdom of Cambodia, the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and the King Kingdom of Cambodia for the immense work that they are doing in this area. In 2015, I wanna give you some light of where we are going 
so that you can encourage yourselves and other countries to really ensure that you are nominated for the progress that you will be making. We will be looking at uh, equity and right-based approaches in 2015. We hope all of you will be working real hard to achieve what we hope um, um, will become some examples and models that we can all put out there and celebrate and see what countries are doing in that particular area. These Resolve Award recipients have accomplished remarkable things in very challenging circumstances. They have impressed new partners in a variety of sectors. They have dedicated resources to finding effective ways to reach underserved populations. They have worked tirelessly to shift attitudes and mobilize political will. And I would like to add, actually, take control of the political will because they represent the government. And perhaps most importantly, they have engaged directly with women and girls to empower them in making decisions about their own lives. It's no good doing something for people, but doing something with people is really important. And so for these awards, we really look out for those governments and those organizations that are able to work directly with women and girls so that they are participating in making decisions about their own lives. I have learned from women and girls that I have met throughout my life, and specifically in the last two to three decades where I have worked entirely for women and girls, that they value, what they value most is the idea of having them be part of the decision making in what happens to them in their own lives. Each of the award winners today is helping bring about the kind of security for women and girls in their countries that they themselves want and want to own and be able to help drive it to the right ends. We know that women and girls are not alike in their needs, in their experiences. We know that when we talk about girls, some are in school, some are out of school, or we can't even account for some of the girls. We don't know where they are because they are not part of the statistics that we have in our own countries and in the world. We know some girls are pregnant even before they are the age of being mothers or parents. We know some have children. We know some are married, not because they want to be married, but because they are driven to something that we can't even call marriage because they are children. Their needs and their dreams differ from place to place and from girl to girl and from woman to woman. And country governments are paying more and more attention to the context that shapes the lives of women and girls and specifically adolescent girls, recognizing the complexities of their situations, their lives, their environment. One truth that I am repeatedly reminded of, not just by women and girls, but everyone that I meet along the way, is that all people prosper when they have access to opportunities. And when they have access to good health, they prosper even the more. And when they have access to reproductive health, to choices that come with the reproductive health, they actually do not only prosper for themselves, but they bring prosperity to our nations, to their communities, to their families. This is what we are striving for in recognizing people for the Resolve Award. And for the adolescent girls, this is particularly important. They deserve opportunity to fulfill their own dreams, and they need the tools and knowledge to shape their own futures. For this reason, the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health is giving this year special focus 
to award in innovations which drive progress for adolescent girls. The Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health recognizes the governments of Afghanistan, Cambodia, Peru, and Tanzania for their leadership and for being the hub around which civil society, the private sector, donors, and so many others can engage collaboratively together. These governments demonstrate that their strength is not in trying to go it alone, but it is about the wisdom of collective impact, the wisdom of collective leadership. This year's Resolve Award winners are recognized for outstanding achievements in two areas, service delivery and policy development. Please join me in applauding them. Thank you. And so allow me to present our first winner, the Republic of Peru. The Resolve Award for Policy Development goes to the Republic of Peru under the leadership of the Ministry of Health, 10 government ministries, regional and local governments, civil society and youth organizations collaborated and gave input to create a multi-sectoral plan to prevent adolescent pregnancy. It features five cross-cutting objectives that will help drive down rates of adolescent pregnancy, addressing health, education, violence, among other issues. Peru has taken the bold step to, to say that the girls matter. And for this, we recognize, we recognize and award Peru as a model example. I invite His Excellency Ambassador Louis Enrique Chavez Basagoita, permanent representative of Peru to the United Nations office and other international organizations in, in Geneva to receive this Resolve Award for policy development on behalf of the country of Peru. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your kind words. Um, in, um, in many years of uh, career, I had the opportunity to represent my country in different aspects, and uh, I, I thought that was rewarding uh, until today. So uh, um, thank you very much for making me discover a, a new face of, of my own profession. Um, now, um, uh, to, coming back to a more formal uh, plan, let me, um, on behalf of the government of Peru, um, express my, my gratitude for uh, this uh, reward in recognition of the multisectoral plan for the prevention of adolescent pregnancy. I also wish to thank the Aspen Institute and the Global Leaders' Council for Reproductive Health for making this uh, possible. Adolescent pregnancy is both an issue of public health as well as human rights. Out of 100 adolescent girls 15 to 19 years of age, 13 are pregnant or have been already been pregnant. This is a public health concern as adolescents face heightened risk of maternal mortality, neonatal mortality, and infant mortality. And this is a human rights concern as early childbearing limits the opportunities of our young women and can make them more vulnerable to illness, poverty, and gender-based violence. While there have long been efforts to address this challenge, the rate of adolescent pregnancy in Peru has not changed in nearly 20 years. Therefore, we knew we needed a new approach. The multi-sectoral plan for adolescent pregnancy was then developed by many ministries working together, including the ministries of health, education, development and social inclusion, justice, women and vulnerable 
populations, labor and employment, interior, foreign trade and tourism, and foreign affairs. Regional and local governments, civil society, and youth organizations joined efforts with these ministries, making an invaluable contribution. Together, these stakeholders identified five key objectives that we believe together can create a future in which teen pregnancy is reduced and our young women will have greater opportunities. These objectives include delaying sexual debut, completing secondary education, incorporating comprehensive sexuality education in the national education curriculum, increasing the use of modern contraceptive methods among sexually active adolescents, including those who have already had a pregnancy, and reducing violence in all its forms. The broad base of support and strong multi-sectoral approach which produced this plan will also be essential to implementing this plan and achieving its goals. We must invest in our adolescents and enable them to make decisions that are based on opportunities, not on limitations. We are honored to receive the Resolve Award from the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health and will carry this honor into the work before us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. It's such a beautiful country that he comes from. I am so lucky that uh, all of the four countries are countries in which my own organization works in extensively with women and girls, so we can really keep watch on you. So I think that being a member of the council and privileged to give this award means that I will continue to follow up to see that they are keeping up to what they have promised before all of you. So I'm really delighted. Thanks for Peru. It's now my pleasure to announce the Resolve Award for Service and Delivery that goes to the Republic of Tanzania. It's a, a country that is a neighbor to my own country. I come from Kenya, and I could easily speak to him in Swahili if you allowed me, but I won't. In Tanzania, almost three quarters of the population lives in rural areas, presenting challenges for reaching women with reproductive health services. And 47% of the population is under the age of 15. That's a lot of people. The Ministry of Health and Social Welfare is partnering with the USAID and other innovative programs spearheaded by in gender health to reach women and families in the underserved areas. TACA AIDS, Restless Development, and UNICEF partnered in a youth-led community-centered project called Mabinti Toshike Hatam, Girls, Lesbian Leaders. The program is making great strides in empowering girls and reducing the vulnerability, their vulnerability to HIV and AIDS and unintended pregnancies and gender-based violence. Tanzania is a large country. Traveling within it takes a lot. And they are trying ext extremely hard to ensure that every corner of the country is reached. I have their pleasure to invite His Excellency Dr. Saif Salemen Rashid, Minister of Health in the United Republic of Tanzania, to receive this award on behalf of the government of Tanzania. Thank you very much. Uh, this is as well my first time to be outside the country to receive an award for my government. Therefore, this is a very great moment. <laughs> Your Excellencies, Ambassador, Ministers and Delegates, on behalf of the government of Tanzania, uh, it's my pleasure to accept the Resolve Award in recognition of our commitment to innovative holistic approaches 
to reproductive health. Reproductive health is about so much more than health. It is linked to gender norms, education, livelihoods, community well-being, among others, critical issues. Based on this awareness, we are engaging multiple sectors to meet the reproductive health needs of the women and girls in Tanzania. Many women in Tanzania live, as previously said, in rural areas beyond the reach of health facilities than that can fully meet their reproductive health and family planning needs. The limited access to full range of contraceptive methods can be a barrier to women's health and well-being, and the well-being of their families and communities. In gender health, in close collaboration with the ministry and other partners, including Mary Stops and PSI, have been driving progress to expand outreach to communities in greatest need by using approaches that engage community leaders, government agencies, and international donors, the uptake of family planning, including long-acting and permanent methods, has increased dramatically, especially in underserved and hard-to-reach populations. And in both rural and urban areas, young women and girls need the resources and capacity to prevent HIV and unintended pregnancy. The need to live in families and communities free from gender-based violence. Empowering young women and girls is critical to addressing these challenges and we are proud of the partnership between Restless Development and the Tanzania Commission for AIDS, UNICEF and the project Mabinti Tushike Hatamu, as previously said as well, which in Swahili phrase means girls, let's be the leaders. Through this young-led, community-centered approach, adolescent girls gain access to key services and strengthen their capacity for making choices that ensure their safety, reproductive health and rights, and economic and social well-being. The pilot program reaches over 7,000 people directly and more than 40,000 community members indirectly, helping to change attitudes on the rights of girls and their value to society. These innovative approaches are tailored to address the specific challenges and opportunities we face and are designed to have lasting impact. We are honored to receive the Resolve Award in recognition of these efforts. We look forward to building on those successes in the future. On behalf of the country, I say thank you very much. It's wonderful. I owe a lot to Tanzania. I must give a little personal thing. When I was very young, Mwalim Nyerere, the former president, um, called me from a crowd just like this at the University of Dar es Salaam, and he said, until our continent of Africa recognizes women and women's education, we are not going to make progress. I want you to stay in school and in university and finish your studies. I never went back. To be told that by the president of the country and we picked up was really important and so I owe a lot to Tanzania. And um, when he used to come here several years, <laughs> When Malim Nyerere used to come here in Geneva for several years, because I worked here in Geneva for 20 years, um, he always gathered us, many people from the south, and gave us his wisdom, and that was really important. So let's keep mentoring other people. It makes a difference. Thank you. And now I have the pleasure to go to the recognition awards and to recognize our two great countries, that received the recognition award, first with the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, a great country going through a lot. 
The Global Leaders Council's award special mention to the Islamic Republic uh, of Afghanistan for its courage, resilience, and persistence in driving progress to meet the sexual and reproductive health needs of women and girls. The perils and pitfalls of pregnant women in Afghanistan have been many. The Ministry of Public Health has prioritized reproductive health, maternal and child health, and has made great strides in engaging other ministries, parliamentarians, and community and religious leaders in addressing the reproductive health of women. I invite His Ex Her Excellence, Dr. Suraya Dalil, Minister of Public Health, Afghanistan, to receive this Resolve Award special mention for the policy development. Yeah, Distinguished colleagues, friends, dear fellow ministers, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you. Thank you for giving the chance to be here with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this award is presented to Afghanistan, to Ministry of Public Health of Islamic Government of Afghanistan. But this honor goes to thousands of staff, health workers, medical staff, nurses, midwives, physicians, managers, who work in Afghanistan in a very difficult circumstances. With this honor, we also honor those communities, parents, women, men, who really work in this area and do the, uh, believe in, in making a difference and ensuring health services, including reproductive health services, are delivered to the families. This honor also goes to our partners, to non-governmental organizations, to civil society, to academic institutions that have been working with us and have come along the way in this journey with us. And very importantly, it goes to many women who still die in Afghanistan from pregnancy and childbirth. Although we have made progress in that, we have made good progress in the last few years with regards to maternal death from pregnancy and childbirth, but still there's, there's a way to go. I would like to emphasize on the fact that I firmly believe that many developmental agendas that we speak this week, whether they are on climate change, on environmental sustainability, on human rights, on population growth, on public health, it takes us back to issues related to governance, and very importantly, to women's empowerment agenda. I firmly believe that women's empowerment is a core principle in development and in, in prosperity prosperity for the families, prosperity for the communities, and prosperity for the society. I think I would also like to note here, in my country, main participation in reproductive health has been remarkable. We have seen in our programs, we have seen in, 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 uh, in the progress we have made that male participation is important given the realities and socio-cultural uh, realities we have in Afghanistan. Yes, reproductive right and sexual right is basic, but very fundamental. It's important for, for uh, it's very important about decisions on number of children that the women make, the decision on access and use of health services, and also decisions on access to information and services. I received this award with great pleasure and honor, 
And thank you very much to those the colleagues of me who have been working very hard in the field, and also our partners, um, international community, United Nations, organizations who have been partnered with us in this journey. Our journey continues. I know it's a difficult journey, but it's possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellence. It's uh, really important, the work that you're doing, and uh, if we were to look at girls' education, there's such a lot of great progress in Afghanistan as well, because that's an area that I've been following as well, and I think you are such a great model for the girls in Afghanistan as well, in, those, in that areas. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now, as we go on, we want to recognize um, and mention the, uh, the, kingdom, the, the Kingdom of Cambodia for the great work that they are doing. The Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health and Rights offers a special mention for service delivery to the Kingdom of Cambodia. More than a decade ago, the Cambodian government recognized that there was insufficient care for pregnant women. Since then, they have increased the number of healthcare centers and increased access to skilled birth attendants from 8% in 2002 to 66% in 2012. I think that is remarkable. That is remarkable. Maternal mortality decreased from 437 out of 100,000 to 206 out of 100,000 in 2010. Cambodia stands as a strong example of progress that is possible with steadfast government commitment and support for the reproductive health. And for that, we recognize the effort that they are making. And I invite His Excellency Dr. Mam Bonheng, Minister of Health in Cambodia, to receive this Resolve Award recognition on behalf of the government of Cambodia. Excellencies, Honorable Ambassador, Ministers, Distinguished Member of Global Leaders, Council for Reproductive Health, President of the Global Fund for Women, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of the Royal Government of Cambodia, and my own behalf, I'm delighted to have the honor to accept the result award given for innovative and scale-up approach in accelerating progress toward universal access to reproductive health. Taking this opportunity, I would like to express my heartfelt thank to the Aspen and Institute Global Leader Council for Reproductive Health and the World Health Organization's Department for Reproductive Health for co-hosting this precious event and for selecting Cambodia as a recipient of the 2014 Result Award, which I just received in a few minutes. Cambodia is highlighted this honor and very proud with this award. It shows an international recognition of Cambodia, a fought and achievement for improving reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child care services delivery, public health infrastructure, and health care network in order to enable greater access to skilled birth attendants and essential services, including birth spacing and immunization across the country. I would like to highlight that beside the tireless contributions and tremendous hard working of health professionals and supporting staff, 
health achievement up to date result and receiving this international award today or owing to the correct part of political leadership, its determination and appreciate, appreciate the actions, especially under the leadership of and the commitment with the strong support and health sector of Samdai Hun Sen, the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Cambodia, and the First Lady Samdai Kete Prem Munrani Hun Sen, the President of Cambodia Red Cross, along with national and international recognition and numerous awards for her work with Cambodia Orphan and Poor, HIV and AIDS awareness and prevention and her emphasis on women issues with effort as assumption to the United Nations Secretary General Action Plan for Women and Children Health, combined with solidarity of Cambodian people and support from our friendly country, development partner, international and national organization. Cambodia has made remarkable progress in reducing maternal and child mortalities. And it's on track to meet MDG 4 and 5 target. The access to skilled birth attendance and reproductive maternal and newborn health care services has continuously increased during the last 10 years. The introduction of Fast Track Initiative Roadmap in improving reproductive maternal newborn and child health, midwifery incentive for promoting delivery at health facility or officially employment and considered to be key factor contributing to the maternal, infants, and child mortality reductions. Among the success factors of you need to be highlighted. On the supply side, it's linked to substantial extension of public health infrastructure through public investment, rapid productions, and recruitment of midwives, and placing midwives in very every health center as well as strengthening skill of midwife, increasing numbers of emergency obstetrics and no natal care services with 20 was 24 hours access. On the demand side, we have been able to reduce financial barrier through fee exemptions, mechanism of free of charge care for the poor using health equity funds. Government subsidized scheme, community based health insurance, and reproductive health vouchers. Besides, together with our partner development, we invest in mass media campaign in community health education, encouraging women to deliver in health facilities. This combined approach led to significantly increased delivery by skilled birth attendants at health facilities and reduce maternal mortality ratio in Cambodia from 437 to 206 per 100,000 live births, CDHS 2010. In conclusion, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, this award is for all of us to for my co-workers, doctor, midwife, nurse, and for all people who work very hard to save lives for youth, women, and children in Cambodia. This award also motivate all health professionals to work even more harder to improve qualities of continuum of care for women and children, from pre-pregnancy to pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum period, from childhood to adults. We aim to reach equity access to reproductive maternal newborn and child health and further reduction of maternal and newborn mortalities. On behalf of the Royal Government of Cambodia, let me assure you, we stand committed to continue this noble work of improving health of youth, women, and children in Cambodia. Taking this opportunity, I would like to express my deep thank to all donors who have provided the support to Cambodia that we can achieve this great success in the reproductive, maternal, infant, and child health. And I would like to call for more support to Cambodia from our development partner 
and tackling challenges and more work that need to be done together. I wish you, Honorable Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, good health and success in your important mission to improve the health of the people and the globe. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I want to lift up um, one area that he touched, which is really, really important. I've had the privilege of serving on the Intra-Health Board, whose executive director we have here, and the issue of the personnel that work in the healthcare institutions is so important. And I was so pleased that in your remarks, Your Excellence, you mentioned the issue of the healthcare workers, whether those are doctors, they are nurses, they are other people, the environment they work in, what they need to do their work. I have seen it as we have struggled to think bigger about this area of the healthcare workers in the framework of the intra-health on their board. And I was really pleased that you mentioned that, as well as the fact that men and women work together on these issues, as mentioned by our sister from Afghanistan. And for that, we are very, very grateful. And then coming towards the end of uh, this aspect of our program, uh, I'm missing something. Okay, I know why I'm missing something. We're supposed to take a photo together before, <laughs> before I can say the final words. Okay, so let's do that. I invite Michael back to the stage. I want to say on behalf of the Global Leadership Council, this was really important for us that you could come and celebrate this together with us. We, we are really committed to ensure that we bring these issues to the public. The leaders of these councils are many policy leaders, leaders of government, leaders of uh, civil society movements, and um, leaders who really want to be a voice or to use their space as a space to bring to the fore light important things that affect the reproductive health and rights of women and girls wherever they are. And I'm privileged to have been a founder member of this council, and I use my voice as the CEO of the Global Fund for Women the largest fund that really concentrates on women to actually make sure that these issues are heard in every area that we work. And I want to invite Michael to come and um, uh, uh, help us finish this project. Thank you very much. Once again, let me thank uh, my colleague uh, Musimbi for taking us through the awards and also to add my congratulations uh, to all the countries, to the honorable ministers, uh, those that are really representing the, the countries which are in the forefront. Uh, I think it was Nelson Mandela who said uh, it, all, it's, it always seems impossible until it's done. And certainly uh, we can do it, and this is the evidence. Uh, when we can reflect, when we can celebrate the success, when we can share some of these uh, uh, success stories and draw lessons and review the challenges and go back again to those who are making it possible and say these are the outcomes of the excellent work which you are doing. So colleagues, uh, uh, we are coming to the end and I'll be 
inviting the host uh, department uh, in WHO, the Department of uh, Reproductive Health and Research. Uh, but let me take time to, to thank uh, once again our colleagues from the Aspen Institute who have really been working very hard uh, behind the scenes. Uh, I think we need to recognize Elise here and Arian who are standing there. Let's really give them a big hand for the excellent work they have done. I would also like to, to recognize uh, our sponsors, USID, who have been with us right from the beginning, who gave us uh, this award, this grant, in order to have the opportunity uh, to share and come together. Uh, and uh, the Global Leaders Council is represented here uh, by my colleagues, who really are mentoring us, who have been there with us, who have encouraged us, who have ensured that uh, certainly at the end of the day we can sit and celebrate when we hear about these reductions in maternal mortality, when we hear about the extent to which uh, those young girls are coming up, uh, when we hear about how uh, the respected teacher was able to say to a very young lady, uh, with the whole nation will prosper when you are able to achieve uh, whatever education you can achieve. So uh, with these last few remarks, I would like uh, to invite uh, Dr. Lali Sai, who is a coordinator in the department, who is representing the director, my colleague, Marlene Timmerman, who is held up somewhere, and she's going to share with us her closing remarks. Thank you. Welcome, Lali. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of my department and my director, Dr. Marlene Temerman, who uh, due to a last minute emergency had to replace our assistant director general in an event, who wasn't able to come, but she's on her way, she's coming for, for the reception. On behalf of her, I would like to thank again uh, to uh, the Resolve Award winners for sharing their stories with us. It is a pleasure for the WHO Department of Reproductive Health and Research to partner on this annual event because we believe that reproductive health is central to global health and development. As you heard from many of our speakers tonight, we know reaching girls is imperative for our future. So we decided, we had decided to focus this year's uh, special focus on of Resolve Award on innovations that reached adolescent girls. And we heard wonderful stories from four of our winner countries. I would like to share again my appreciation for the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health, all the speakers and organizers of this event, and especially to the countries who have shared the progress in advancing reproductive health in their countries. The Resolve Award recipients reminded us of what can be accomplished. They also remind us of what remains to be done. So each of us have a role in making that happen. As now the global conversation shifts to the post-2015 development agenda, we hope these stories of innovation and political will will inspire all of us and other countries. We have made considerable progress in MDG 5 and uh, achieving reproductive health, uh, access to reproductive health. However, our work is not yet done. In order to attain our goal of universal access to quality of care around the world, we must work, uh, accelerate our work, but also we must turn to our focus in eliminating inequalities in access. Therefore, as was reminded by Musumbi, I would like to put out a call for nominations for the 2015 Resolve Award. The awards for 2015 awards focus will be on innovative equity and rights-based approaches for achieving reproductive health. As we have seen tonight, Resolve Award recipients can teach us, inspire us, and point the, late, uh, the way forward. Let us continue to identify and celebrate the most innovators driving progress at every level for the next year's award. Please join me in a final round of applause for all of our speakers here tonight, and I invite everyone to stay at the reception, which is going to be in the garden. And finally, please take a moment to fill out the brief survey that, has on, that are on your, on your chairs uh, tonight. Thank you very much.
until 2015. We meet again. Thank you.